So welcome to our talk on using clustered golden signals to avoid alert fatigue at scale. My name is Anusha Raghunathan, and my co-presenter is Sahil Badla, and we are both software engineers working at Intuit. Now let's look at the agenda for the talk. We're going to give you a background of Intuit's Kubernetes-based platform infrastructure. And we'll introduce you to some of the problems that platform engineers like us deal with while building, managing, and observing our Kubernetes-based infrastructure. We'll then introduce you to the concept of cluster golden signals, why we did it and how we did it. We'll follow that up with a demo, which highlights the power of using cluster golden signals in determining lowering your MTTD and MTTR during a service incident. We'll then talk about anomaly detection in Kubernetes clusters and what we have done with anomaly detection. And finally, finish off by talking about what the future holds for this project and takeaways. So for those who don't know what Intuit it does, Intuit is a FinTech platform company that is popularly known for building financial products and services such as TurboTax, which is used for tax prep and fi uh, tax filing, QuickBooks for accounting and payroll, Credit Karma for credit score analysis, and MailChimp for small medium business marketing needs. Now all of these pl 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 products and services run on our Kubernetes-based platform infrastructure. Now let's look at the numbers at a glance. This fleet that runs all of these powerful products and services it comprises of about 275 plus Kubernetes clusters. These are about medium to large size Kubernetes clusters that comprise of about 20,000 namespaces hosting 2,500 production services. Now note that these are just production services. We have a whole bunch of pre-prod services running E2E, QA, L, perf environments that are just the same number of services or even higher. And all of this supports about 900 developer teams comprising of 6,000 plus developers. So you get an idea of the large scale that we operate at. Having said that, let's look at a day in the life of a platform engineer that manages and observes this fleet. Now, there are several components to a Kubernetes cluster, as we all know. Starting with every node that makes up a Kubernetes cluster, to Kubernetes components, pods, and other synthetic monitoring. So for a node, we monitor the CPU, memory, disk, network, and processes. For Kubernetes components, we monitor all of the native Kubernetes components, as well as the cluster add-ons that we add on to the cluster. Then we also monitor the pod state. And finally, we have synthetic monitoring where we launch on-demand workloads to monitor the health of a particular subsystem. Now, what are the metric sources for these components? For node-level metrics, we go with Telegraph. Kubernetes, we use Prometheus, like pretty much everyone else. Pod state, we use kubestate metrics. And for synthetic monitoring, we use something called active monitor to do synthetic monitoring. What we do is we use Argo workflows to launch on-demand workflows to check the health of a particular subsystem within the cluster and make sure that it's working as expected. And all of these metrics are generating alerts. And they go to our platform engineer, typically the platform engineer on call. And they're frantically looking at a bunch of dashboards, trying to do some run book lookups, and then trying to mitigate the problem, reducing the MTTD and MTTR of, the, of whatever issue is at hand. And note that this they have to do for 275 plus clusters, and there are about 100 plus clusters, 100 plus alerts per cluster. So you do the math. It's pretty overwhelming for our platform engineer already to be on call. Now, let's make things a little interesting and throw in an incident, right? Who in the audience 
Likes to be on an incident call. No one, right? Yeah, neither does our platform engineer, but she has no choice. Now she's pulled into an incident call, whether it's a platform problem or a service problem, you know that platform engineers are always involved. And she has to answer questions like, hey, you know there are one or more services that are impacted by this incident. What is the health of the cluster that is running these services? How, are, how healthy are there? What alerts in these clusters am I gonna be looking at? How can I quickly resolve and tell whether it's a service issue versus a platform issue? And how do I determine the blast radius of the impact? When I know that a service in a particular cluster is being impacted, how do I know whether services in other clusters are affected or not? What's my blast radius? So the platform engineer is getting very overwhelmed. In fact, this is how they feel. They are not just getting overwhelmed, they are drowning. They are drowning in a sea of alerts. Now, I don't know if any of you have this experience being in platform engineering or being an SRE in your organization, but some of us do. In fact, whenever I go on call, that's how I feel, and it's no fun. So, what the platform engineer truly needs is they want to reduce the MTTD and MTTR for an issue. They want to have less false positives and less false negatives. Alert me only if I have a problem, and always alert me if I have a problem, nothing in between. And I want a few good quality signals from my clusters. I don't want to be alerted on everything, just filter the signal from noise. And I might also like some tulips. So having said that, in the next section, we will be talking about how we focused on solving for all of these platform engineer problems by defining the concept of cluster golden signals. And for that, I would like to hand it over to Sahil to take over. Thanks, Anisha. Um, let's talk about uh, cluster golden signals. So uh, term, the term golden signals is, uh, is not a new term. It has been around for a while now in the services field. And I want to quote uh, <clears throat> the, the Google SRE uh, handbook that golden signals are a reduced set of metrics um, that give a wide view of the application that is running. So um, um, it is suggested by the handbook that if you want to start monitoring something, these are the basic set of uh, signals that you should start monitoring. So um, <clears throat> the, the golden signals um, has been around uh, for some time now, and um, we're talking about latency, traffic, errors, and saturation. Uh, the good news is these golden signals can be applied on platform as well, and that's what we're going to uh, talk about more. Uh, but, to, uh, but before we uh, dive deeper into cluster golden signals, we want to look at uh, look through the perspective of service owners um, and then figure out what exactly the service owners care about. Uh, uh, they care about the, the top-level requirements, that is, the availability of the service, the, the scale of the service and correctness. And to figure out this problem and uh, to build this product uh, in the right way, we started mapping these core capabilities to the components uh, uh, in the Kubernetes platform. Um, and they, uh, they are as follows. Um, for availability, we have the um, cluster control plane and cluster networking that powers the availability and then how uh, the cluster components uh, work with each other, and then this is the core of the cluster. For scale, we have um, cluster autoscaler um, <clears throat> that, that scales up the cluster, and then we have horizontal pod autoscaler that is scaling the, the pod needs. And for correctness, we have a couple of components that is cluster authentication, cluster networking that powers the, uh, uh, the networking between the pods and critical cluster add-ons that provide um, a certain level of functionality. And these add-ons are running in the cluster, um, taking care of certain functionality individually. And some of these add-ons are uh, the VPC, the CNI, uh, which is the pod networking uh, add-on um, that we run. And then a couple other add-ons, which is 
uh, handling a certain functionality in a different way, like monitoring, observability. And at Intuit, we have about 30 of these add-ons providing um, critical cluster uh, functionality, and that all is part of the, the application needs covered under correctness. So from here, uh, <clears throat> let's talk about cluster signals now. We know we have these concepts available from the application side. Um, can we use these in, in platform? Yes, we can use them, and they are based off of the core um, traditional golden signals as is. And the components have been defined as errors. And there are components in Kubernetes which, uh, which can get into the error state, causing the applications to fail, so we want to track them. And uh, there are components that are dealing with APIs or providing the baseline for the APIs in the services to run. So we want to look at the latency of these components as well. Capacity. Um, these platforms are running on infrastructure. So we want to look at all the components that power the, uh, the infrastructure itself. And then are we hitting the limits there? And traffic, which is the type of workloads running on, on these clusters. And we want to measure the patterns, and then we want to see how, uh, how saturated they are and what, uh, what can be defined as a good or the right or a normal pattern for a certain type of cluster. So once we have all of these signals, it's really easy to uh, get the overall health of a cluster by aggregating all of these four golden signals over all components. That gives us the cluster health. And then it could be defined in the three states, which is healthy, that means all the components in the clusters are healthy. And degraded, when at least one of the components is degraded, we want to change the cluster state to degraded. And critical, if at least one of the cluster state is critical, we want to show that something is wrong, uh, really wrong in the cluster. And that's the third uh, <clears throat> and the most critical state, the critical. So uh, taking another closer look at the error golden signal, that's the first signal that we, that we talked about. <clears throat> so in a cluster, um, uh, right here we have a query, which, uh, which is a Prometheus rule that combines all of the components' error signals into one signal, which is overall error golden signal of a cluster. As you can see in the picture, we have components from order scaling, control plane, authentication, a couple from networking, and add-ons all aggregated together that give out one error signal as a golden signal for that cluster. And this can be defined into the three states by using a number range. So for us, uh, <clears throat> this, when this uh, adds up to zero, that means all, all, the, all the cluster's uh, components are healthy. And then if the sum is greater than 10, they, then we change the state to critical. And then when it's in between this, this is, this is a degraded state for us. So um, before we uh, go into um, individual components, I want to talk about error states. So a component can be in error states. And then to, the right way to measure the error state is uh, in two ways. One is the success rate. And uh, let's look at one of the components here, uh, which is node local DNS. Um, and it's really easy to measure the success, um, uh, uh, success rate SLA over a preset window of time because this component gives us a response code. And by filtering over the response code, we are able to figure out how many calls have been failed. And it's a simple calculation from there, uh, which is denoted in this Prometheus rule. Um, we are filtering all the calls that have been made uh, by this component that have returned with a serve fail error. And you subtract that from 100, that gives you the success rate or the success percentage. But um, <clears throat> defining the success rate over a preset window of time, like for us, uh, it's a five minute window that gives you a success rate. And we can use that success rate um, over, a, over a range to figure out if the cluster state uh, is healthy, degraded, and critical. So um, like we've defined in this Prometheus rule, if the success rate uh, drops below 99%, we are changing the state to, uh, to degraded. And then if the success rate uh, drops below 95%, we are changing the um, cluster state for this component to, uh, to critical. <clears throat> so that's the first type of uh, 
error metric uh, that we can use to form this golden signal, which is uh, success rate. And um, <clears throat> going to the, the next component, we'll talk about AWS CNI and a different way to uh, look at the errors from this component, that's error count SLA. So some components are not per se dealing with the APIs, but they provide an essential functionality, and if there is an error in that functionality, we have error counters that increment with every error you see. So um, <clears throat> for those type of components, what we can use is a static threshold, um, a number, if you go beyond that over a preset window of time, then uh, this component state is changing. So for us, as shown in this picture, if we have less than two errors in a five minute window from uh, this component, AWS CNI, we are, uh, we're saying that this uh, component is um, healthy. And if it grows be, uh, beyond five errors in a five minute window, we're saying that this component is critical because this exceeds our threshold. So um, we, we've defined how we, we, we've come up with this formula to get overall cluster health and digging deeper into uh, one golden signal, which is um, errors, and then how different component aggregated together gave out this one, um, uh, one golden signal for one particular vertical of cluster golden signals. So by adding this, we've built a system. We ultimately want to um, get rid of the alert fatigue. But this is, uh, there's no secret sauce. We, to get there, we have to build a, a toolkit, um, a mechanism for it to alert us when the systems are not doing healthy. And how can we achieve that? So um, that's what the platform signal, uh, platform owner woes were. We want to be alerting on the right signal. So we have to basically assign um, the right priorities based on the type of the clusters and filter out the noise uh, and, uh, by looking at uh, the right signals at the right time. And <clears throat> ultimately, it improves the, uh, the mean time to detect by acting on critical clusters faster. And improving, uh, uh, for improving the, the mean time to resolution, we have to uh, build an automated uh, incident creation system based off of these alerts when critical system are in unhealthy or critical uh, situation, we want, to be, we want to alert the platform engineers as soon as we detect the error. So we start jumping into uh, fixing those issues before our application team starts seeing those issues as well. So with all, um, <clears throat> all that in place, uh, we are actually making the system better by adding these new signals um, and not um, getting overwhelmed by these new metrics. So uh, this is one simple Prometheus rule for alerting. When, once you have the overall um, status of the cluster, um, when the status.health of a cluster is greater than zero, which is um, not the healthy state, it can be either degraded or critical. For at least two minutes, we want to alert with the right summary and description of the cluster that um, uh, that the, uh, the platform owners can take a look at and then jump into fixing um, this issue immediately when we see that. So with that said, we have the, we've, we've got the bigger picture and I want to dive into a demo of a simulated incident that explains a similar situation that happened in one of the test clusters where we have a, an actual anomaly in the cluster and we have services running in the cluster and how soon we figure that out using our, our, our new system that we have built. So, um, so I want to pause uh, right here to give a quick summary of what's going on. So as we see, uh, there are uh, three screens here. On the left, we have the state of the cluster. Uh, and then this is uh, looking at one of the component, which is AWS, C, uh, AWS VPC CNI. And what it does is it provides the pod networking in the cluster. It is the CNI layer, and it's responsible for assigning new IPs every time a new pod comes up. So that's the, the basic uh, functionality of this add-on. And then we've injected a failure, which 
stop this component from talking to AWS APIs, which means it won't be able to provide new IPs to, to new pods that are coming up. And on the right side here, I have another Prometheus dashboard that shows um, the state of an application running in namespace. Uh, and it has, um, the, the query right now is showing the number of pods running. So which means that the pods are running and they are in the healthy state. And we have three pods right now. And by um, injecting this, this anomaly, as we can see this, uh, the state of the, uh, the application is doing good, but the cluster is not right because this component is already failing. And um, in, in the picture, uh, um, in the demo here, my, the, my window is stretched to one hour. So this in anomaly was injected in the cluster almost an hour before uh, we start looking at the, the application. So you see the, uh, uh, the application is perfectly fine and the application owners do not know about this, this problem that is already there in the platform. So let me continue the, the video to show, um, uh, we're gonna look at the, uh, the pods and the, the status of the pods. So I'll do a, a quick describe here over the pods to see they are in the running condition. And then um, quickly go over um, increasing the number of replicas of the pods to see um, when they start failing. Um, so um, you can see this is the overall status of the component and then overall status of the, the cluster. Uh, it's all critical already. And it's almost been an hour since it has been in that state. But the application owners do not know about that thing uh, because their pods are all running fine and healthy. And as of now, it's not affecting their component. And then we added uh, this anomaly by simply changing the IAM role permissions of AWS component. Um, so to, to see the application failing now, we would go and then edit the deployment of the, um, uh, of the application and then add more replicas. And this is where this component will, um, will stop uh, providing new IPs to, to the new pods that uh, they'll, be, um, they'll be coming up. But um, on, on, a, on an instance type, there is still a warm pool of IPs that might be available. So by bumping this up to five, let's see if this application goes into a bad state uh, right away or not. So I'll do a quick time jump here so that the, the Prometheus chart loads. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll see that um, the, the application pod is still not affected by this anomaly because we see the number of pods up and running now are five. That means we still had some warm IPs available on that node in the system. So the application owners um, still do not know about this anomaly happening on the cluster, which is already injected an hour ago. Um, so take, to take it up a notch, let's increase the number of replicas for this application to 15, and we want the system to fail um, to prove this demo that um, you know, the, the component AWS CNI is failing and it'll soon run out of IPs. So um, changing the deployments, let's look at the status of the new pods. And we see um, there are a couple of pods in container creating phase, which means it'll, it, it, some of the pods are pending. And um, let me do another time jump here to let the Prometheus chart load. So um, the chart reflects the, the current state of the, the pods, which is 12 in running, more, in running phase and three in pending. So something is wrong, and now the application teams have detected the issue. Uh, let's describe on one of the pods why is it failing to look at the error message. And right here, we will see um, you know, the, uh, the status of the, the pod and the error state, uh, what it's complaining about, um, which is um, plugin type AWS CNI failed to assign a new IP address to the container. So this is, this is a really interesting example of an anomaly that's going on in the system. And by building this new system, um, component, uh, the platform owners will right away uh, be paged about this thing happening even before the, the application owners know about that. This is 
this is one scenario where it took about an hour to, to, for the application owners to know about this, because you know, uh, this is when their application scaled up and then experienced this problem in the cluster. But that, that can be days, or depending on the type of the cluster, or you know, um, uh, hours. So, um, so the, 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 the point I'm trying to say here is building the system right, getting the right metrics out, we are helping the, the platform owner woes go away and then get into a state where we are looking at the right metrics, alerting at the right time, and then getting to the real issue at the right time. So with this system built, we, we rolled out the first phase of this project. The cluster golden signals implemented on all our clusters, and then we started taking learnings from those rollouts, and then uh, Anusha, I'll hand the, uh, the mic back to Anusha to talk about what the future looks like. Thank, thank you, Sahil. That was a powerful demo. In, in short, what we saw was if you relied only on your service golden signals, you would take a lot longer to detect an issue with your platform. In fact, we, he, so what Sahil showed was uh, he introduced a bunch of scale-up events in order to trigger the real issue that to be caught in the service side. But if you actually built your cluster golden signals, we were able to detect it within five minutes. In this demo, it was five minutes versus 60 minutes. And in a real life situation, that scale-up event can happen hours, days, weeks after the real prob problem happened in the platform. So um, it's, it's much better to actually have golden signals on the cluster side alongside the services as well. Now we rolled out uh, the cluster golden signals for an error vertical for the error pillar. And um, we ran into a few issues. We had a specific set of static Prometheus thresholds for all of the golden signals, and we assumed that that would work fine across our Kubernetes fleet. And what we noticed was we assumed that they were all similar clusters when in reality that we had a heterogeneous mix of clusters. Um, and these clusters were coming in various shapes and sizes and were hosting a variety of workloads. For example, our TurboTax clusters are very seasonal. They are very busy from January to April when it's tax filing season in the US and not so busy the rest of the year. And then we have our QuickBooks clusters which had varied, varied traffic during US daytime. So 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. everyone's logging in, doing their payroll, accounting, and then logging off, not so busy the rest of the day. And then we have platform clusters such as bill clusters, uh, ML processing, stream processing clusters that are very high volume of workloads. So you have a whole bunch of jobs that come up at a time and then they are done and then they go down. They're not like long-lived long pods. They're very short-lived jobs and they have a very high volume as well. So what we realized was, hey, you know, we're looking at a static one-size-fits-all set of thresholds for a dynamic set of clusters that have very different set of workloads and behaviors. So how can we actually detect anomalies within a cluster that are specific to that cluster. You know, maybe have a baseline for every single cluster and then detect any abnormal behavior in that cluster rather than having static thresholds. So that's when we started exploring anomaly detection. And um, how, how can we actually detect anomalous behavior that's specific to a cluster, right? And uh, at this point, I wanted to just call out a SysDig blog. I like their definition of what an anomaly is. They talk about anomaly as an outlier in a given data set, pulled specific to an environment, and it's a deviation from a confirmed pattern. And anomaly detection is about identifying these anomalous observations from a set of data points collectively. Right, so if any of you have been doing this in your infrastructure, you know that anomaly detection is very useful for these use cases. And um, so uh, among a lot of tools that we explored, one was Z-score. Z-scores are a pretty popular statistical measure that are used for finding outliers in a normal distribution. And uh, it takes historical data and then determines how your new data falls in that pattern and whether it's an outlier or not. And the general calculation for Z-score is, you know, your current Z-score metric is basically 
uh, the, the metric value minus the average over time of, divided by the standard deviation. It's basically a mean-based approach. And you get a z-score, and you can actually map that to say any score that is between one and minus one, it's regular un anomalous behavior. And then if it's outside of two and minus two, then it's considered to be degraded or maybe slightly anomalous. And then you, if anything is over the three and minus three range, then it's considered to be really anomalous behavior. So we tried this out, we tested this, and then turns out there are several pros and cons to this approach. Pros, people really understood what z-scores were. They're very well understood. There is a lot of support and documentation about what z-scores are. And um, they did provide what we wanted, which is cluster-specific anomaly detection. And it has simple and built-in Prometheus rules. So writing our alerting rules were pretty straightforward using the z-score for anomaly detection. However, there were cons. Z-score is, again, like I mentioned, a mean-based approach. So detecting an outliers in, like, let's say you have a downward spike and there was an anomaly there, it was difficult to actually detect outliers at that point in time because it would take an average over a period of time, and then it would normalize the data and say, oh, okay, you're just, your data is just fine, and it would not detect that as an anomaly. And it assumes that it's a Gaussian distribution. Your input data is Gaussian distribution, so it assumes that bell curve, and real-time data is nothing like a bell curve all the time, so there were cases where it did not work. And it's very sensitive to outliers, right? Like the point anomaly within a huge spike can make the detection very less uh, accurate. And for that, we had to actually keep weeks and weeks worth data and then use those for getting a reasonably good uh, z-score for anomaly detection. And um, overall, this approach did not work. So we looked further, and that's what we're gonna talk about the future of this project. We looked further. And that's when we looked, uh, we landed on a NUMA Proj. Now, NUMA Proj um, is a open source project that has been incubated and open sourced uh, at Intuit. And it's a collection of open source projects for real-time analytics and AI ops on Kubernetes. And uh, there are several projects in this umbrella, but the main two ones that we're gonna talk about are NUMA Flow and NUMA Logic. And NUMA flow is basically for massively parallel real-time data and stream processing. And in this case, the stream that we're talking about are the metric streams that we are getting from Prometheus. And NUMA logic is basically a collection of ML models that can do anomaly detection. So we use this framework to see whether it would work for identifying anomalies in our Prometheus metrics emanating from cl Kubernetes clusters. So we experimented with a few develop development clusters. So I'm gonna just walk you through an AI ops pipeline and how we went ahead as, um, with the architecture. So on the top, you will see all of the Prometheus metrics and the aggregate rules that we were talking about in the previous section that Sahil mentioned. So there is the node local DNS, and then there is the CNI API error counts all over a five minute aggregate window, and then a whole bunch of other critical Kubernetes components that, we, that were emanating some aggregate metrics um, for error counts. And then Prometheus, we have Prometheus installed on all of our clusters, and that's actually scraping all of the metrics every 30 seconds. So that's your data stream, and then in all of the clusters, we install an AI ops namespace. In this namespace, we have a NumaFlow controller, and this controller installs several CRDs to manage the AI ops pipeline and perform the anomaly detection for us. So everything inside this purple box are basically pipeline steps that will help us in this, uh, in, in this anomaly detection. So the first phase is basically a window phase, and this is where we actually, this takes as input whatever metrics are being ingested from Prometheus. And the, re the reason why we are windowing here is because every metrics comes in as one data point from Prometheus, but our ML models actually require a sliding window of data. So the windowing phase actually collects and windows the data before it's being sent to the ML model. And then there is a pre-process phase where there is some transformation applied to that data to be consumable by the ML models. 
Then we have inference where there are predictions that are calculated from the model. And then the threshold is where we, uh, is the phase that is responsible for calculating the raw anomaly score. We use an auto encoder ML model to actually do this calculation. And then in post process, the anomaly scores are, uh, are transformed into like a human readable anomaly score from zero to 10. The mapping is anything between zero and three is non-anomalous behavior. Three and seven is slightly anomalous. Seven and 10 is really highly anomalous. And that's when you actually alert and say, hey, you know, maybe this is something you need to be looking at. It's critical, maybe um, uh, convert it to an incident or so on. And this is also the phase where we push the anomaly metric back to Prometheus so that you can do or any of the alerting and incident management on it. And uh, uh, of course, from the threshold, we have the training phase, which is where the models are trained. And so for each of the metrics, the pre-process and the main neural network and the threshold models are actually stored in a model storage, which is basically used back for inference, uh, where we are actually calculating the anomaly score for the next set of iterations. And um, with that, this is what are the future stands for our cluster golden signals project. We want to be able to integrate AI ops into Kubernetes clusters, golden signals, and be able to very smartly determine whether a particular Kubernetes cluster is healthy or not and avoid alert fatigue. So the main takeaways are you know, implementing cluster golden signals will help reduce. In fact, we are seeing some promising results within Intuit already. And anomaly detection using Numa Proj is promising. Go check out our GitHub page on uh, Numa Proj. The main three ones that we'd recommend are Numa Flow, Numa Logic, and then there is a special one called Numa Logic Prometheus, which has the Prometheus integration for Kubernetes clusters. And with that, thank you very much for your time. We'll take some questions if you have any. So the question is, how did we end up having 275 plus clusters? Um, so the, if, if on an average, our clusters have about uh, four, 40 to 50 nodes. And uh, the reason why we came up with this kind of cluster level isolation was because we had a lot of business units that needed more autonomy in how the clusters were managed. So we have like the bigger level BUs, uh, like I said, TurboTax, Mint, Credit Karma, um, QuickBooks, and all of those have different products and services that they offer. So they needed the isolation for each of, each of the bigger services that they were offering, and they wanted more control over it. And again, there were platform um, teams, like for example, our build team has like a couple of dozen uh, clusters that manage Jenkins and beyond, and they needed more control over how they were running uh, their clusters. So in general, we have a lot of services and use cases that are being managed uh, over Kubernetes. So yeah, I mean, we, we could have, if your question is more like, hey, you know, how about having larger uh, clusters, but then have a smaller number of larger, large clusters? Um, we do have, um, I mean, we run performance uh, testing whenever we have a new um, Kubernetes release and whatnot, but we've noticed that having a, a medium-sized clusters is more manageable. We used to have our own uh, control plane, and we had to manage like um, etcd, API server, and all of the control plane components and uh, upgrading them on a very regular basis. So because we're a FinTech company, we have to rotate out our nodes every 30 days to keep up with security and compliance and we go through an AMI rotation. So that process is, will take a lot longer if we had like say 1,000 or 2,000 node clusters, right? And, um, and then the, it's also harder to provide isolation to the uh, end user uh, business units if you had like a, like a 2,000 node cluster, but then you're still trying to find some sort of isolation. So in some sense, yes, it is RBAC, but at uh, 
DU level or a use case or whatever. Yeah. Good question. Yes. Good question. So the question was for all of the ML processing that, that's happening using Prometheus metrics, how much uh, human resources? Is it human like resources? Oh, like okay. Like cluster resources. Like, I'm assuming it's not lightweight, probably. Okay, so yeah. So how much cluster resources do you need to, to do this additionally? Yeah. Uh, good question. So uh, the main resources that are being consumed are the like, so, like I mentioned, there is the NUMA, there's a separate namespace. Then there is the NUMA flow controller, which is basically a pod. And then you have like three instances of a pod for HA. And then you have the pipeline. The pipeline actually auto scales depending on your stream. So, if you have a whole bunch of metrics coming at the exact same time, then it's going to actually use HPA and scale up and then or scale down. Right? So, the pipeline has roughly about, uh, I would say, six to eight different steps. And then each of that can actually scale up. So what we've done, like in our test environment, we did not create a separate instance group. Or like basically we use um, instance groups to actually provide some isolation in between uh, nodes within a cluster. So we did not, but that's one thing that we are we are considering to have all of this processing run on its own instance group so that it can scale up and down as needed. Uh, so yeah, so I would say anywhere between three to five nodes can be allocated for, like, uh, I don't know if you use AWS. We do use AWS and we use M5 2x large, I think, um, by default. So yeah. I'd say three to five um, nodes on M5 2x large. Separate IG to do your processing would be good. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Um, I have a question about um, the alerts you have. So it provides a separate alert signal. I don't need to have an alert on every metric. I can aggregate the alert signal. Mm -hmm. um, what is your criteria when you set the alert? Is it like as simple as like every alert must be actionable? actionable? Sure. Um, so the, the question is, um, how do we how, how do we respond to the alerts, and how are we making those actionable um, uh, steps on each of those alerts? And basically, like, what is the strategy to um, uh, to optimize the alerting, right? So um, the alerting, as we mentioned uh, in the slides, that um, we are assigning priorities to um, to the um, to the alerts from the type of the cluster they are coming in, right? So um, the uh, production cluster being the the um, you know the, the top level priority. So definitely, yes, for uh, for those clusters, if we are getting um, critical signals, we are taking a look at them first, and then the degraded ones. So I think this is a simple strategy to look at the most critical workloads running in the clusters, um, and then assigning them the right priority, and then responding based on that. Um, which is like you know, um, which is a learning for us as well, and we are improving from that because um, um, you know it, it is it is additional level of alerting that is being added. Uh, but as you saw in the demo, um, uh, um, is it benefiting and is it the right metric to alert on? That is really the problem that we are you know trying to solve and you know gradually improving you know day by day. Um, that. Uh, we are alerting at the right time, and then that should be the right alert for the engineer to take a look at, and we're not wasting time there, right? If there are no more questions, we actually have some t-shirts giveaway, so if you're interested, you can come and get some, or we can ask you questions to see if <laughs> you are paying attention. <laughs> You guys want to do a trivia? Under? Sure. sure. Okay. <laughs> cool. All right. So we talked about two Numa proj project names. Can you tell us one of those? Yay! We have a winner. Um. So Sahil's demo had. Uh, 
two different signals. One was a service signal and one was a cluster golden signal. What was the MTTD on the, M on the service golden signal, roughly? Okay, it was 60, about 60 minutes. About an hour. What, what, does anyone remember <laughs> what it was for the cluster golden signal? Yeah, it was status.health, that was a good, good observation. Uh, but, but we were actually showing you like every so many minutes, we were actually trying to set this uh, cluster golden signal. How many minutes was it? Yay, 20. you get another <laughs> t-shirt. <laughs> it's a plus one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are, uh, we talked about four Intuit products. Can we name three? That's one. Mint? Yay, okay, we have a winner. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.